All right, we're on our way over to runway eight. Uh, some of the more eagle-eyed among you can see way off to the left side there. There's a building way in the different in the blah, in the difference. Yeah, in the distance. Uh, that's roughly where we're going. So you can see just how long of a taxi this is. We'll put some speed on here so we can get over there. Hear the engines coming up and going back down. Um, ah, well, that's okay. Um, up in the top left corner there, where it says GS ground speed, that's our speed in knots. You generally don't want to exceed 20 on the ground. You want to turn somewhere around 10 knots so it's not doesn't feel like you're hand breaking it around the corner. So we're getting pretty close already. I'll stash this thing again because that is directly in the way. should let us coast just about to where we want to go. And I'll even start setting up now. We want these lights to come on, all those lights come on, these go to continuous just in case we would lose an engine on takeoff. We can start it faster if we hit the ignitions over to continuous. Step on the brakes here. You want to stop so you can still see that whole short line in front of you. Alright, the strobes come on at this point like that. Our pedo heats can come on now. And the overhead looks good. We will ding the cabin to let them know that we're just about ready to take off. can be on, weather radar comes on, and hit that there. Uh, TCAS goes all the way over there, or the transponder rather. Um, flaps are set. I think all that's left to do is set the clock. We'll do that right before we give it power to take off. We're ready to get blasted on out of here. Two nine or eight seven. The wind, the weather just updated. That's what we have in there, so that's good. And the wind was, I believe, the same as before. Do a quick check here. Clear left. Clear right. We are cleared for takeoff. The yellow lines that are painted on the runway are painted for aircraft exiting the runway. Um, when you're taking the runway, you don't really have to follow those. So we won't even come to a stop here. We'll just go ahead and start our clock. The first officer would start his, but we're the only one flying today, so I'm not going to worry about his. Bring these up to about 40%, let the engines stabilize like that, and there's Toga takeoff power. Now you really hear those things come to life. We'll keep this thing centered on the runway. It's wanting to push us left just a little bit. There's our rotation speed. We'll pull back like this. And come on. There we go. Immediately the wind started blowing us. 
that's a positive rate. We'll take our gear up. We can start bringing the flaps in. Take another notch of flaps. around a little bit because the wind is it's a little breezy and pretty soon you'll hear the engines come back because we're getting close to 10,000 feet remember we have to stay there for a minute Okay, we can go ahead and ding the cabin, let them know that they can use their electronics now that we're at 10. We're building some speed now so we can continue our climb once we get past Lass, which we did just there. Come over to the co-pilot's seat and hit that button there now we'll start climbing again. And we'll just pretend that we got cleared all the way up to 30. There we go. Um, I guess I never said I talk myself through these procedures because it is task saturated getting this thing in the air um, out west here at these higher elevation airports um, you do not have to fly with all your lights on but um, closer to the ground, out here, I just wait until 18,000 feet before I turn off all the landing lights and everything extra that we don't need up at cruise. So there's 14,000. We're climbing out at about 33, 3,400 feet a minute. It's a pretty healthy clip. Okay. As we get higher, the climb rate decreases a little bit. Here's 17,000 feet at 18,000. We'll reset our pressure, barometric pressure, by clicking standard, like that. And watch the altimeter, it'll jump. And that's now set for higher altitude. That's just so everybody is reading the same thing. 
up here in the higher flight levels where there's all the passenger jets and everybody else. So, now we'll take off all our extra lights. Um, cloud cover isn't too bad. I won't worry about sticking any um, anti-ice on. Um, when you're climbing out, if you have pretty significant cloud deck you can stick the anti-ice on just to keep ice from forming on the airplane as you're punching through the clouds. Seven minutes into the flight and we're at 22 already, 22,000 feet. It, the bumps settled down. Hopefully it's a smooth ride up at 30. If not, we can always go a little higher. That would be something that would happen in the real world as well. If your ride isn't smooth where they put you, you can always ask for higher or lower. So there's 24,000 feet. I will wait to start into the actual why I'm making this until we're up at cruise, just because I want to make sure we don't forget anything on our climb out here. There we see our left wingtip out there. It's flexing a little bit, not too bad. Twenty-eight. Here comes twenty-nine. We'll come in here quickly. Go here, and we will reset our cost index so that we go a little faster once we get up to cruise. So now we're going to shallow out our climb to build some speed, and that'll work out just about perfect because here comes thirty thousand. Bring this back to the likes page. And let's see, is 30. Yeah, we're well above the clouds here, so we can cruise right here. There's what looked like a bump. If we do get some chop up here, we'll go higher. I think this is going to work out for us, though. So there we are, 30,000 feet. We can... Well... Here's where you kill the fasten seatbelt sign. If the climb is pretty smooth, they may even turn it off prior to getting up to cruise. I'm just gonna hold off for a second and make sure it's not too bumpy. Or actually, you know what? We have fake passengers anyway, we'll just pretend. There are some bumps up here. Let's take it up to, we'll come up here first. Actually, we'll start the climb first. We'll go up to 32, see if it's any better up there. So we'll do that by going there, and hitting that button there, and now we'll go up to 32. Because we changed our f cruise altitude, we'll reset our altitude in there to 32, so that the cabin climbs also. So now we're climbing again. Yeah, it was bumpy at 30. 
So hopefully a couple thousand feet will make it at least a little smoother. So here comes 32. And hopefully this is a little smoother for us. Still a few bumps up here, but I think we'll we'll live with it. We won't go up and down and all over the flight levels today. So now I will start into why I actually even made this video. Um, why I've been gone for so long, that's the glaring question. Um, quite honestly, I've been under the weather for a little while. Um, I had some stuff going on. It was just really getting me down. Something fairly interesting. Look in the top left corner there. So our ground speed is 473 knots. Uh, let's do some math real quick. That is... 544 miles an hour is our speed over the ground right now. It's jumping around a little bit. The reason it's jumping around is look just below that. So the winds up here at 32,000 feet are 224 degrees. So they're coming from right there, roughly, off our left wingtip across the airplane at 84 knots. That will push you around a little bit. So, if you could see a top-down view of our airplane flying along, along the ground, we would actually be very much crooked flying along here. So the nose would be pointed roughly off like so. And the airplane is flying straight like this, but the nose is off like this to track straight along the ground. Hopefully that made sense. Maybe I just muddied it up more by doing that, but I think most of you get it. Alright, so... That was a deviation. But, um, yeah, I was just under the weather. My motivation was not high at all, so it was just hard to do anything other than work and whatever else I needed to do. So, yeah. Um, I wouldn't say I'm better. Um, I don't know that I'll ever fully recover, um, but there are people who are helping. Um, if I tell you, you should maybe check this video out sometime. Um, if I specifically tell you that, uh, you've been helpful in kind of getting me through it. Um, something I heard, I generally do not um, follow the news very well. Um, it just depresses me for the most part. But, uh, I heard about a little boy in the UK who had some kind of terminal brain condition. And they were keeping him in a hospital over in the UK. And um, from what I understood, there was an Italian medical team that thought maybe they could do something to improve his situation. And the 
British, the way British healthcare works is evidently the government decides when you are terminally ill and if they seem to think that you've exhausted all your options, uh, they pretty much tell you when you pl bleh, pull the plug on your kid to the point of having armed guards at the hospital to keep the parents from taking this kid to Italy to get him looked at by another doctor. Um, if that's my kid, I better be able to exhaust my options at least twice before you tell me that I have to pull the plug. I just can't. And this is a thing? This is how they run it? This is how the healthcare works? Um, I'm curious to know if anybody's ever been like, Okay, if that's how you're going to play, I'll just show up with a couple weapons and forcefully make my way somewhere else. Uh, not that I'm condoning that, but, I mean, good grief. The hospital turns into a prison that you are condemned to die in. Yikes. That's just... scary. So that... And, uh... Maybe I mentioned... The kid died, I think, three days ago. And it's all over the news, so... Yeah, the parents will get donations and whatnot, but what are donations when your kid is dead? Like, seriously. I just, I don't get it. I do not get it. Had to cut the video there for a second. Um, we can go ahead and look at our progress. We've been flying since we took the runway. We've been flying for 30 minutes. 31. It is 325 local so getting later in the afternoon the cloud cover went down a little bit um, poison reservoir is about 80 miles from us let's zoom out here did we Oh, that's why. Okay, so there's all the airports around us. I meant to have that turned on. And just in time, my home airport, Casper, is... Let's see, can we see it? Can we see it? Oh, there's a cloud there. Maybe not. Maybe not. Okay, never mind. Casper's down there somewhere. But we'll jump back into the cockpit. This, I imagine a number of you will skip over, but I figured, why not? Somebody might be curious just exactly what we're dealing with here. Um, this is a 737-600 series by PMDG. Uh, Precision Manuals Development Group, something like that, is what it stands for. Um, they make a 600, 700, 800, and 900 series. Um, the manual for these airplanes is, I want to say, 1,500 pages long. Uh, it is crazy how many systems they have integrated into this thing. Um, how... Uh, uh, 
just how this whole thing operates. I mean, every single, you can move pretty much every single switch in here. Um, the lights work, the instrument panel lights, so you, you can't see them, but uh, the lights come on, flaps, boilers, speed brakes, and failures even. Um, if we did get a failure, we'd likely get a master caution, and it would show up here. Um, these you can't see my mouse, but I'll zoom in here. Uh, we'll look at the co-pilots. So you see the fire warning, then the master caution, and then there's a black rectangle to the left of there. And that is where your caution is gonna populate. It's gonna tell you what system is failing. And it also, the uh, box on the co-pilot side has different systems than the captain's side. And that's because whichever side of the cockpit the failure is on, uh, that's what's going to populate in that box there. So, if we had a fuel problem, we would get an indication on the captain's side here, and that's because the pumps and the crossfeed are over here on the left side of the overhead. So we would address that fuel issue from the left side of the cockpit. So that's how that works. Um, look at our progress again here. 20 nautical miles to Bozeman. I also have scenery for, you saw on the ground in Denver, that was not the default scenery for Denver Airport. I got that online also. Um, that was a, you could, I think you could tell pretty quickly that that was a pretty accurate representation of DIA there in Denver. Um, I should have, I don't know if at any point you could see, I'll have to go back and look at the video, I don't know if you could see the tent terminal at any point, but um, they did a pretty good job of modeling that airport. Um, that was done by Flightbeam, is the company who makes that. Um, Bozeman, yep, there it is, off our nose there. That's Bozeman, and it'll more or less load in here. There we go. I have scenery for down there, too. We could have flown in there. Um, I would have had plenty of time to do my talk and still make the descent into there. But um, that's a pretty cool little airport down there, too. Uh, the scenery is pretty nice. It's up here amongst the Rockies. There's the mountains behind us and to the Mostly to the left. There's stuff off to the right also. Clouds are clearing up a little bit, at least over Bozeman they are. Uh, I think the ground textures look pretty good. Um, I also have a program in the background running those, and they do a pretty good job of showing us uh, what the ground below us looks like. So now we're starting a right turn, gentle right turn, over to Helena now. That'll be our next leap. 